But before we start, we'd like to know how many of you are from the BI world. Target, okay. And then, you're from? Phoenix, Arizona. Anybody else from BI? Yourself. From? Fidelity Investments. So all the rest are going to your from BI. Then, all right. So, how many of you have been practicing Agile for the past one year? More than a year. More than, okay. That's a cue to say that the presentation is going to start. Thank you, everybody. We'll just start with Raghu. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Thanks, Anu, and um, apologize for the delay. Um, one lesson learned is not to use 16 by 9. Four by three for your presentations. Lessons learned. So um, the way we kind of structured this talk is um, we want to kind of talk about a little bit about BI, data analytics, data science, uh, what challenges we've had, and then um, then talk about how we actually leveraged agile and continuous integration and continuous development or delivery for that matter. And then finally come back and talk a little bit about um, some of the use cases where we actually used it and what our experience says, how it worked, how it didn't work, uh, and kind of give some insight to people um, what really worked and what didn't work. So hopefully at the end of the session, you will see some use cases where we actually made it work and some guidelines on to what to do and probably what not to do. So firstly, how many of you have heard about orbits? One, two, three, cool, awesome. I don't have to talk too much about orbits then. Um, so I personally have been with orbits for a little over 12 years now, um, mostly in the Chicago office. And then the last three years, um, I've been in Bangalore, um, helping start off, um, our office in Bangalore. And as part of this office, we work on um, mostly half of our office's data, uh, which includes BI, um, advanced analytics, and then the other half is product development, which is mostly building up our websites and stuff. So um, again, I think um, we, 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 we're not that old of a company in Bangalore, at least like two, three years. But in US, we were one of the top three travel agencies uh, for the longest time. We started in 2001. Five airlines um, kind of started orbits. I have a gift if anybody can tell me what are those five airlines. Wild guess. North American Airlines, United American, Delta, no, big airlines, Continental and Northwest, basically. So um, in fact, our first um, uh, machine names, or rather our uh, internal server names, were Dunk LLC. Basically, it stood for Delta, United, Northwest, Continental, American, LLC. So that's kind of how we started. We, are, we, are, uh, we call ourselves a tech company rather than a product company or anything because we have um, really good people who have been involved in open source technologies, um, contributed a lot of books to the community. Um, and uh, with that, I will actually move on to the next part of our story. How many of you actually heard about Expedia.com? OK, a little bit more. So last year, we actually got acquired by Expedia. So Expedia is um, basically uh, number two right now in terms of travel agency and price line kind of neck and neck where we are. Um, so Expedia started in 96, I think, um, during right after Travelocity. And Expedia actually owns Travelocity, um, Orbitz, Hotwire, Hotels.com. Um, anybody knows where Expedia started off? Garage. <laughs> Actually, no, it's an expensive garage called Microsoft. Um, so yeah, so eventually they spun off from there and had their own stuff. Um, in fact, we have offices in Gurgaon, Pune, Mumbai, Bangalore. Um, Bangalore being us, obviously. Um, Gurgaon is our bigger office, around 800 people right now. So. Um, I actually have two questions here. Um, let's see if you can take a guess. How many room nights do you think Expedia books in a year? I'll give you some clue. Um, it actually fills up an entire city for X number of days. 
I, I don't need the number. You can tell me which city and how many days. US. Manhattan, actually. It can fill, yeah, probably at the end of the day or end of the session. Um, it actually can um, um, do 30 days of room nights of all the hotels in Manhattan. So that's the amount of hotel rooms that we as Expedia book there. And that includes not just Expedia, the family of Expedia, pretty much everybody, right? And um, the other thing is airlines, right? I mean, they all go neck and neck, air, hotel, car, blah, blah, blah. So how many tickets do you think we book in a year? Okay, it fills up um, N number of planes, a type of plane. 737, 600 planes. So with this, right, you can imagine the sheer number of data that we collect. It's not just air and hotel, like it's a slew of travel products. So with this being the foundation, we want to kind of talk about a little bit about how we worked at Orbis and how Expedia kind of deals with data, what are the challenges we have, um, basically, how we actually used Agile and continuous integration, especially um, to the world. So um, I'm going to skip this slide. Basically, I just introduced myself. So at this point, what I want to do is I want to bring Anu in here, who's going to talk um, more on what BI data and the challenges that we face. And then we're going to go to the next section of it. So I think Shruti told I have and I lost what you said over there. I'm still figuring out what I'm doing. So 17 years back when I started BI, my first job, it was very simple. Just a data warehouse, build a cube on top of it and give reports. That's what it was. Mostly waterfall, you have time-based, people-based, these are the problems. But over the last few years, we have all seen how BI has evolved. Right? It has become a very small part in this big plethora of landscape sentiment analysis, social analysis, infrastructure, um, architecture, self-service platform, data platform. So you can name it technology initiatives, business initiatives. So all have gone into the landscape of BI, big data, big data analytics. So as this, it's all more about unstructured data, real-time analytics, batch, right? So when, when this place is evolving so much, so much, so much in an unstructured way, I think it becomes more and more important to bring process on the floor. So how, how you actually deliver these projects, how you deliver these um, different types of solutions, business or uh, technology driven becomes more important and how your teams are, what are you processing, what is your philosophy, how soon your feedback is, how, how are you knowing that you are reaching what you want to reach, right? Are you on the right track? Are you doing that square thing and the round thing? Right, so over the last few years, we have always done, we have done Agile in like 20 different ways or 2,000 different ways, right? It's, it's never been a right way to say what Agile is. Since my uh, joining Orbits uh, probably two years ago, I, I can say that we have learned and I, I saw some hands go up when we said plus five years. So I'm just two year old in Agile, a, a, a good practice Agile and uh, We've seen how what has worked for us in the BI world, specifically in the BI world, where we have different kinds of projects. We have where business says, this is what I want very clearly, structured data. We have uh, done Agile in ways where there are migration projects, like move DB2 to Teradata, move Green Plum to Teradata, right? How do you go about doing it? Because business are not going to use, give their time over there because they already have their solutions. It's a technology-driven initiative. It's your uh, CTO sitting over there and saying, I want this to be done in this uh, period of time. Then you have the other cool projects, right? The semantic layer. You want to build a self-service model for your uh, business. So how do you go agile in that way? So these are small things. We are not, I'm not uh, in the next few slides. We're not going necessarily into the tools of how to do it. That's basically a choice. But the process, the philosophy is not a choice. What you need to do, what you need to keep in mind is what we have learned, and that is what we will be going through in the slides, in this BI landscape. Yep. 
So how many of you can actually relate to this picture out here in your world of BI, right? So um, I think if you look at any organization where they've done practice of BI, um, I can speak for Orbitz. We, we did BI right from, I don't know, 2002 when we kicked off our site, 2001 when we kicked off our site, and we had a BI practice. Um, but it's evolved over the last decade into what it is today. And every time there is a learning opportunity in terms of um, what works, what doesn't work, um, what do you do, how do you do, everything, right? So the first challenge, so I come from a product development background. Um, that's where my most of my experience has. But last five years, I've been working on the data side of the world. So the first time I actually moved over and I, I, I looked at the problems and said that, why can't we use Agile here, right? And we've done Agile since 2006 in our organization. Why can't we actually do it here? Um, then actually came out the problem saying that um, there are different set of skill set that they are there within an organization, and within BI especially, right? How do you actually put them together and really look at solving a problem rather than basically saying that, hey, my job is going to be taking six months of whatever you need. You come back after six months, I'll tell you what it is, right? So this involves your ETL, your data modeling, your visualization, um, whatever the analyst related work. So time to market was very important for us. In an e-commerce company, right, you have a hypothesis or let's say you have something that you want to do from a product perspective. You have to act quickly because the market changes so quickly for us that we can't expect to think of something and say, hey, we'll do it after three months. Our release cycle in product development is actually weekly with a, uh, at least 10 to 20 deployments every day. That's the kind of speed we move in the non-data world of product development. Now, how do you take that and bring it to the BI world, right? So that was one of the big challenges that we had. And the second challenge we had was real-time analytics, right? And everybody talks about real-time analytics. And I don't know how many of you guys actually do real-time analytics within your organization, but you have to question the people who are asking for real-time analytics. Do you really need real-time analytics, right? And those are the questions we started asking our business people, right? They cannot change the strategy near real-time. Impossible, right? If somebody says they're gonna change their strategy of growing room nights in near real-time, then they're lying to you. So you need to figure out where real-time makes sense. So we found out and carved out business areas where real-time makes sense. Campaign management, right? Let's say you launch a campaign on TripAdvisor, which we call the travel research area. You want to see how the campaign is happening right now, not tomorrow. You want to see, OK, are people really coming to our site based on this? What are they doing? That's the great case for us for in terms of real-time analytics. Personalization, right? We do a lot of personalization on our site. You cannot have stale data to do personalization, so you need to funnel the data back in real time or near real time so that we can actually do personalization. Simple example I'll give you is, um, anybody's heard about the controversy of orbits with Mac and PC? Nobody. All right, so this was in 2010 where we actually did personalization based on the browser settings. Um, and we said that, hey, um, based on our analysis, we noticed that people with Mac tend to book higher rating hotels than with people with PC, okay? That might be true, might not be true, but according to our data, that was true, right? So we wanted to do a test and see, okay, is it really true? So we had to funnel that data in real time for our personalization and saying, okay, show them better hotels first in the sort order, right? Don't touch the pricing, just the better hotels on the top. And we actually proved the hypothesis. And that's one of the examples where, for us, real time made a lot more sense because it was not just the browser, we connected a lot of other things like, for example, is this person a, a new visitor or a repeat visitor? Is he coming from which marketing channel? So there is a mix of variables that we actually collected. So that's the second example of where real-time analytics made sense. And the third one, which was really big for us, was BIOS's build, right? If you go back in 2009 when we started using Hadoop, um, the ecosystem was not as great as it is today. 
So we had to make a choice or a decision to build a lot of things in-house, and we still use some of those things. And actually, right now, you look at the slides further down, we, we actually moving some of those things to cloud right now. So that's, that's traditional BI, right, what we were before. So where does Agile come into picture, right? Um, again, like I said, my background is mostly product development. We've been doing Agile since 2006. Um, 2008, we transitioned Agile in the large. Do you guys know what Agile in the large? So anyway, so Agile in the large is basically what we did was um, the entire organization, right? They work in smaller Agile teams, uh, either a feature team or a component team. And it includes the, it includes everybody who can actually get things into production and make decisions. So obviously a product owner and UI and data modelers and stuff like that, right? But we got our business teams and marketing teams ingrained into that model. Because now you have a pod or a feature team which can actually execute end to end with making decisions, right? So that's what we did in 2008. Now when we come back to BI, that was not as so simple for us. Um, I will tell you our journey was very tough, uh, getting BI people to start using Agile in 2010. One, um, people usually come from a waterfall background, so they are always um, looking at the way of designing the model, doing the ETL, building the visualization, and then putting it in front of the customer. So for us to change that mindset was the trickiest thing and the most difficult thing. So if you think you're using Agile, I think I want you guys to question yourself, is it the mindset that we have changed with people or the behavior of using two week sprint, stand-ups, retrospective, is that what we are doing? I think that's the key difference out there. So for us, it was a rough journey and I, don't, I won't say we are, we are there, perfect, we are perfect, we're not. It's an iterative approach, we learn, we change. Uh, further down, we'll talk about a few examples where we started playing around with the sprint size in terms of two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, what is ideal? So that's kind of one of the things we challenge. Um, again, so that is kind of where we really introduced Agile to BI, right? So getting in front of the customers in a shorter span of time, even though it's a tiny bit of information that they need from the big picture. So that was our first step in terms of getting BI transition to Agile. Again, I think the question is Scrum, Kanban, what do you want to do, right? Eventually, you need to figure out what's the right rhythm for you and then stick to that. And Anu's going to talk a little bit more of some of our use cases where we actually use Scrum and some of the use cases where we actually use Kanban. So that is kind of, uh, again, we don't enforce our teams to stick to either of the ways so they can pick what it is and based on that, they execute. So actually, can, um, has anybody read this book called Phoenix Project? Okay, fantastic book if you guys haven't read it. It's about IT and DevOps. So in this book, the common theme is called Whirlwind. So what Whirlwind is, you will relate in BI, right? So you're working on some changes. Somebody from marketing team is gonna come over and say, hey, we are bleeding, our sales are low. I need, you, I need your help to pull this data out. That's basically Whirlwind. You, you cannot control it, no matter what. Right, And in those situations, what do you do um, when you're in BI, right? Do you drop your existing work and pick on that, or you say no to that? It's a very tricky situation. I'm sure each one of you have been in the situation if you're in BI. Um, that's, that's really tricky. So you guys have to be cautious of that in terms of how you balance those things when you're working in the agile fashion. So this is something we actually call disruptive BI. Um, not very common in a lot of the organization. But when you talk about continuous integration, automated deployments, continuous delivery, automated QE framework, outside BI, this is beaten to death. So if you talk to anybody from product development side or like a regular developer, they will just say, hey, what's the big deal about continuous integration? But I would want you guys to go back to your people from different organization in BI and ask them this question. What do you guys use for version control? So I'm asking this question to you guys. What do you guys use for version control? Anybody? Git? Git? Okay, good. When did you guys start using it? A year ago? Exactly. For us, five years ago, like there was basically BI 
didn't use any version control, but they used version controls from the proprietary software that would allow them to do. Like simple example is MicroStrategy gives you a version control. Informatica gives you a version control. So they would still use it, but when you really want to do continuous integration, right, like version control is the fundamental thing out there. So we, we use Git. Um, prior to Git, we used to use something called Acurev and CVS, SVN. So we had a lot, long history of uh, different version controls. So, so that was the first step, right? Changing the mindset of people in BI and say, hey, can you go use Git? And they're like, what the hell is Git? Does it have a UI? Can I use it? Uh, so that's where the mindset and adapting to change comes into picture. So for us, that one was a big deal. Um, we worked through um, in terms of how we integrate this with Jenkins, how do we integrate with Stash. Um, by the way, Stash is called Bitbucket now. I don't know if you've heard. Um, so, and then how do we really enable these people to think in the fashion of CI and CD? So that is where we spent a lot of time uh, last year, actually. Um, and I wouldn't say we are done, but we are all, almost done. We are there. We, we know how to use it. Uh, what to do, so that's pretty much what it is, right? Cloud, again, it's, it's basically, you, you, everybody uses cloud now, right? Um, there are different reasons to why, why you wanna use cloud, but I think it's a very touchy topic when it comes to BI and cloud uh, because of data privacy and all sorts of things, but eventually everybody is moving towards this, so that's inevitable, I would say. So, I wanted to kind of give you guys a glimpse of how we actually use CI and QE automation framework. So for visualization, we use MicroStrategy. And then um, obviously we use Informatica, um, we use uh, ClickView, we use a lot of things. So um, the gist of this is basically we have a Jenkins server that basically executes our automated tests every time somebody checks in. Um, so we use Stash, um, Jenkins, Git. Uh, the one thing we actually tried, I know the bottom portion of the thing is not visible that well. Uh, obviously we use Selenium for all the MicroStrategy tests. So that is actually pretty cool. Um, so if you use MicroStrategy, invest in Selenium. Um, it's actually very good. It's uh, for automated UI testing. Um, and then we, we evaluated this thing called SQLy. I don't know if you guys have used it, but um, it's a paid tool, but we weren't really, not sorry, query search. Um, it's not, I don't know, we weren't really convinced of that, but anyway. So um, at this point, what I'll do is I will transition over to Anu. So you kind of heard where we started with BI and where we are right now um, with both agile and continuous integration. We wanna dive in a little bit more in terms of um, how we are gonna do the use cases or what we did um, what are the use cases we solved? So, how are you doing? Okay. So yeah, when, when as Raghu was telling, there are a lot of technologies, continuous tools, processes that we are following. What we also realized is we need to have, uh, to my point earlier, a lot of discipline on the floor. How we are doing around with teams, how we are looking at your project. When we say envision, when we say execution, development, what it actually means. A retrospective, is it the same for every project? And envision, is it the same for every project? What we realized is BI at a dial is like a live-in relationship. You get in when you want, you get out what, when you don't want, you know, and you, you just keep hovering around. So, yeah, I know. So it makes it more complicated because under the plethora of BI projects, as I talked earlier, as I talked earlier, you have the migration projects, you have uh, business-driven projects where they know what they want, and then you have these data scientists and uh, ad hoc power users, advanced analytics users saying, just give me the data, I, I will know what I want to do. But then you just can't take and give the data. You need to build pipelines, platform, et cetera, right? So how do you go about doing that in Agile? And then the self-service, this pretty little uh, tools which has just to begin with drag and drop, but then it becomes, can you give me a scheduler? Can you give me this? Can you give me that? So there are all these layers that happen in the BI world. So exactly how do you fit in each of these into agile world? And then not to just stop that, you have, sorry, I'm just going loud sometimes. I don't need to say this is important or less important, but um, sorry. 
And then you have global like, locations, right? Like Expedia and uh, Orbit, Jabu was saying, we have Gurgaon, we have Bangalore, we have Chicago, we have Bellevue, and I'm sure Target has the same thing, and several Dell has the same thing. So you have people located everywhere from Brazil, India, China, US, Europe, and all kinds of places, different kinds of roles. So how do you actually um, you know, make sure all are going in the right direction? And uh, OK, I missed my thing. But uh, we know we are agile. We say, move, make your decisions as you go. Make your decisions this way, that way. But we all know that we are time bound. I, you can make your decisions, but I really know that I want this in two months. I really know I want this in one month, right? So you can't beat it. You are uh, time bound. So how do we go about being agile? So I'm going to quickly go, uh, go through three projects that we have done in the last one year. I'm going to slightly touch upon, because of time, uh, what were the challenges and why we decided what we wanted to do. So the first is the most favorite, hated project with any team, that is the platform migration, which I talked about, right? Move from one platform to another platform. Move this repo from MicroStrategy for some decision, move everything to Cognos or move to business objects. So we're all very familiar with this. So what happens with that? What are the challenges? They are time bound because you want to move there. The license is expiring, blah, blah, blah. They are quite uh, lengthy projects sometimes, but they are quite, too, like for example, Teradata, or you have columnar storage, NoSQL database, SQL database. You want to be moving across to say that this is most efficient or that is most uh, efficient. You have a strong user mindset that why do you want me to move? I'm happy where I am. You are pushing them outside of their comfort zone, right? That's a big challenge because you're not going to get their time. Okay, I think half of it is uh, not visible. But uh, anyway, so what we did for these challenges is the first thing is we learned to break down into components, right? For example, in the travel industry, you, have, you know that we have products like air, hotel, car, cruise, etc. So air, so okay, what is the fixing data of air and the transactional booking data of air? Within the booking data, what is blah, 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 customer data, channel re related data, that is your SEO, SEM, and you know how people come in the acquisition of traffic. So we started channelizing the data. So you break, uh, basically, I wouldn't call it vertical slicing. It's also a very controversial subject. But just break down into components that you can relate into. You can say that, yes, this is something that I can uh, relate it as an epic, build stories, and start working on it. The other thing that you would have seen is the team composition, which I said is very important. You know, whether you're going to have a small team, you're going to have product in the same team, are you going to have QA in the same team, how are you going to do team allocation, whether it's 70% of your bandwidth in, in the sprint for your daily job, for your job that is envisioned, and you know, the other 30% for admin support, and your personal goals that you might have that I want to learn Python this year, right, whatever it is. So, we were very uh, clear that we have to attribute only 70% of our sprint. Make sure you put in your vacation or your, unless it's an emergency leave. So such discipline was very, very important. So the team composition and also the, to the challenge that we had teams half split in Chicago and then in Bangalore, how we are going, we, we went through a, ran, a very big exercise in the beginning of 2015 to say we are going to have co-located teams unless otherwise which will be in the same or similar time zone as our business, as much as possible. So that you know you have the product and the QE in the same, and that helped really well. So the iterations, um, I am not able to see that. Okay, there are certain other things like early feedback, iterations were so key that we started, we, we kept talking to the business, to the stakeholders, the feedback. This, when I was putting this slide in Raghu and I was just talking, doesn't, isn't this common sense? But we struggled. We struggled to put this on the floor, to make sure people log in efforts every day, to make sure we have our sprint metrics at the end of the sprint, the ve so we track velocity. And over a period of three months, we could really see the velocity, the burn, char burn down charts that improved drastically. It was a struggle to put it down. And, and though it seems very simple, those were the things. And last year, the same Agile conference, the two people you see on this slide, Anusha and Pradeep, attended. And you see the Scrum Master pointing ahead uh, on the developer who didn't log in the efforts. So the Scrum Master has to be harsh, right? We took it that the Scrum Master will be on a rotation basis. And uh, we, it started off with the lead so that you know they can set an example. And, and then they were all, Anusha is just a college recruit, but she did it, right? So the team discipline and the way we are doing the backlog grooming, the 
spread metrics measurement, all this was very critical for us to finish the migration project. Similarly, there was another other project example, which is a business project, business driven uh, project, the hotel reviews, right? These are user generated content. The, real, the previous project, we knew that we needed a product and a QE, but here we decided we don't need a product and a QE because it's a new venture, it's uncertain requirements, businesses don't know what they really want, we are going to figure it out with the business. So do you really need the same team model? Do you re a sprint envision, whereas in the other stuff was about technical feasibility, about doing a, a requirement for one week and then doing a technical feasibility. Here the, the sprint was more like data analysis, doing a wireframe, getting again an early feedback and getting into the system. So we actually called out what your envision should be. When should your execution actually start? Right, so that, that played a very critical role in, in seeing that we progressed with feedback and the iteration. So here you see the scrum master filling up water bottles because the job of a scrum master is to have no block, to remove all the blocks for the developers, right? So similarly, we had uh, so the techno technology uh, initiated project that I talked about where, you know, it's a moving goaling po goal post, it's technology challenges, you have features starting from little bit to a lot more. So again, here I have not given what we did, but essentially it is about, again, defining what are the challenges we are going to face. Keep that in mind. And then say, okay, my sprint is going to be like this, or I'm going to divide my work like this. I'm going to target it like this. And then go about in that discipline. And then the fireworks, which Raghu was talking about. You're going to have some SLP tell you, I need this report in the middle of the sprint. I need this, there is one P1 bug, some Informatica failed or something failed and you need to look up. That is why the 30% allocation, which I was talking to you earlier, actually helped us a lot with, to not get our uh, sprint work uh, affected uh, when you have a certain time written off. If there are no bugs, good, you have your personal goals and you can always go ahead with them. This is kind of a cheat sheet, not necessarily it is true in all cases, but for us, to at least take a squid, because there's always a question on the floor. Do you want to go Scrum? Do you want to go Kanban? So both the projects that I talked about, other than the semantic layer, we opted for uh, Scrum because of the reasons that it was short iterations. We knew what we need to deliver. We were self-managed teams, right? Whereas on the other side, like uh, what Raghu was talking about, is the spontaneous delivery, uh, consistent randomization, what do you do? So this, this was a quick uh, grasp to say whether we want to go Scrum or whether we want to go Kanban. And uh, what we realized at the end of the year is Agile works with consistent, constant feedback, be it within the team members, be it uh, to your business stakeholders. Again, sounds very simple, but the feedback it was the most critical part to, show, to ensure that you are reaching what you defined for. So finally, this is, this is the last slide. And uh, what, the, not last, my last slide. <laughs> What worked for us? Migration project. Any guess? I already told it. Scrum or Kanban? What's your take? Okay. Yeah, Scrum. Product roadmap driven projects? Either you already know or you've been listening to me. Good. <laughs> the data platform? <laughs> You're good. <laughs> I was hoping. Okay, good. So somebody said Kanban though. So yeah, he gets the t-shirt and you don't. You spill the beans. Anyway, self-service was Kanban and uh, ad hoc's integration. Like he said, we just got acquired by Expedia. There's a lot of integration happening around the world. And we choose um, Kanban because we have to work with a lot of teams and there's a lot of randomized. Yeah, so um, I, we're not going to hold you guys from your tea break. So just another minute, you can bear with us. Um, one thing I want to reiterate from the previous slide is that's what worked for us. Doesn't mean it's going to work for you. So you will have to really figure out what works for you. So that's one thing. The other thing is, again, I cannot stress enough of this mindset stuff because if people are not committed and they don't understand the philosophy of Agile without executing it, then I think that's going to be a challenge. And for us, uh, last one and a half years, continuous integration and 
continuous delivery has been very critical within the BI framework. And then the last one is test and learn. And you can call it search and discovery, test and learn, whatever it is, but um, you need to figure out what works for you. So that's kind of the bottom line. Attrition? What attrition numbers? For us, people? So, um, okay. So, attrition rate, um, it's different for us in different locations, obviously. Um, I don't know how it's connected, but yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, fine, okay. So, uh, nobody quit because we were agile. So, bottom line. So, we do exit interviews. Nobody came and complained you forced us to do Scrum versus Kanban. So, um, but. <laughs> It, it definitely leads to a lot of heated debates, definitely. So. Yeah, like I said, right, people skill set, people mindset. In my mind, those were the two biggest challenges we had. So if people don't believe in Agile, no matter what you do, they are not going to give you the best, and you cannot extract the best out of them. First thing is change them. If they can't change them, figure out somebody else. Right, that's the first one. The second one is skill set. With BI, you have different skill set, right? A ETL person might not know how to do visualization. So we did a lot of cross-train. Again, not everybody were interested in cross-train. We figured out who was interested. We asked them to cross-train across the different areas of expertise. So that was another area for us in terms of working. And the third one, bottom line, is holding people accountable, right? We come to stand-ups. And we upfront to their face, ask what you did. And if they don't have an answer, people are going to hold them accountable. So these were some of the things people were not used to. Yes, one last question. Uh, oh, by the way, before you ask your question, right? Um, if you guys want to know uh, more about how we track metrics, what are the metrics we track, um, feel free to reach out to us later. We'll be more than happy to share some of our burn down charts or metrics that we tracked, uh, uh, challenges and stuff. See. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I would probably, um, I had the advantage because our product development went in first with Agile. So we had almost four years of uh, experience in Agile within our organization, and I was part of that four years. And obviously, you don't question a product development team whether it's successful or not for them, right? So you bring the same concept to BI and try it out. It will work. It has worked for us in way too many places, not to discount it where it didn't work out. So that's. So I'll give you a simple example. I know this was the last question, but simple example I'll give you. Um, have you ever built a data mart? OK, so anybody who's built a data mart, what's the t a simple example I'll give you a site, site analytics. Do you guys know site analytics? Yeah. Right? So if you want to build a data mart for site analytics, what's the time estimation in BI? Just a rough estimate before you give something to the customers. When I say customers, are internal customers. Six months? Three months, eight, that's fair enough. It is nine months is the estimate we got when we started off this in 2010. Um, they said it will take nine months to build this data mart, all right? We vertically slice this based on each of the use cases so that we can actually get one metric to the customer, okay, in three weeks. So we actually took eight months to build the data mart, but guess what, time to market. That makes a huge difference with Agile. If you're giving a metric to a customer, there is a huge difference between giving in three weeks versus at the end of the nine months. That is where you're going to win. So thank you again. Thank you.